Duncan. All of you would have got to know Dr. Duncan much better if you were here in person. He is, he helps to run the Hillman Academy uh, and he directs the Tech Drive X site. So this is the site that has bioengineering, cancer environment, regener tissue regeneration, aging. It's a hodgepodge of so many different things um, and a really eclectic and diverse group of faculty that are down there. And again, hoping next summer when you come back, hopefully we're all in person and maybe some of you will be working with um, Andy and his group down there. Uh, but with that, I'm gonna let Andy kind of talk about himself and his work. Okay, um, thank you for that introduction. Um, thank you guys for all tuning in. I'm really happy to, to be here and talk to you. And really, I wanna say thanks for the commitment of spending the next five hours with me to listen to <laughs> the whole spiel. It's really nice of you to spend the afternoon. Um, that's a joke. I don't see anybody really smiling. That's a joke. So I'm going to try to knock this out in an hour and, um, and then we can, can, can go on about our business. Um, if you guys have a question, you, you can feel free to just um, unmute yourself and ask, or you can write it in um, uh, into, the, into the chat feature and, and we'll get to it as we do. So with that, um, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Good. Good. So I actually gave you guys a title that I thought would be kind of compelling, and it was this, um, oh, hold on, let's see, it was this bottom thing right here, whoops, oh, laser's not working, here we go, okay, so it was this bottom one, liver regeneration. Um, so my lab works on liver regeneration, and it's, it's really interesting. Everybody in the liver field likes to talk about, um, we've known about liver regeneration since ancient Greek times, and I'll tell you why that is. And so I was going to tell you how uh, liver regeneration has changed and what we know about it from ancient Greek times until modern times. But before I do that, I thought I would tell you a little story that's it's a little bit more information about me but it's kind of relevant to how journeys are and how you know, paths get taken. And uh, I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about uh, where I was uh, kind of like sitting in your shoes, basically when I was in high school. Um, and so it's this sort of path up here in my scientific journey, um, but it, it's kind of this loop-de-loop -loop thing where I went from a bunch of different institutions till I got here today. And I think that you know, some of it is, was intentional, but a lot of it was just kind of a happy accident. Um, and so you'll find, and maybe you've already heard things like this, that as you're, you know, working hard um, and sort of planning for the future, that uh, your whole career and path can take all these different side roads. Um, so this is just one example. So let me just tell you, I grew up in Eastern North Carolina. So you can see North Carolina down here in this town called Greenville. East, uh, Greenville is the home of East Carolina University, the Pirates. Um, and when I was a senior in high school uh, from 1991 to 92, um, I, I worked uh, in this lab at, at uh, East Carolina University. So it was like, I think I was at school for two thirds of the day and then the last third I went over to this lab uh, and, and supposedly did research. Well, I'll tell you, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but this guy, uh, his name is Art Bodie. He was in the Department of Pathology there and loved to work with young people. Um, and so he welcomed me into the lab and, and you know, taught me a lot of stuff. And so our lab was really interested in, in um, learning about platelets and how you can uh, basically store them for long periods of time and what happens to platelets when you have certain types of procedures. Um, okay, all that sounded great when he told me about it. Uh, what did I do? I <laughs> learned how to use a pipette man, learned how to look on a microscope. Uh, you, know, you know, I got familiar with the lab. And I think to some extent, that's what you guys are doing right now. Although I suspect you know uh, a heck of a lot more about what you're doing than I did when I was a senior in high school. Um, uh, even though you're doing all this stuff from home. Um, and so, you know, I was interested in, in research at that point. That's sort of what my, my final year, my senior year of high school showed me. And then I went to college, but basically the prior to going to college and then uh, after my freshman and sophomore years, 
um, I went from North Carolina up to Yale University. And I worked in this guy's lab. His name is Jeff Gruen. And his, at this time, all these labs were competing to clone genes. And his lab was trying to clone this uh, gene uh, called hemochromatosis. And so this was a molecular biology intensive lab. Uh, people were cloning stuff and running all these uh, PCRs and gels and things like that. So I, I love that. That was a really cool experience and, and really introduced me to a very different type of research than had been going on uh, when I was in high school. So then I went to college and I went to UNC Chapel Hill, uh, which is kind of in the middle of North Carolina. Um, uh, it was a great place. And when I was a sophomore, I had this excellent teacher. Her name is Pat Bakila. And Pat uh, uh, had a research lab and she studied meiosis. So meiosis is how you make sperm and eggs. Um, and uh, she welcomed me into her lab when I said, hey, I'm interested in, in, in learning a little bit more about what you're doing. So go into her lab and, and basically for two years, I was an undergraduate researcher um, and we worked on uh, our, our model for looking at like uh, uh, gamete formation was uh, working on uh, mushrooms. So it's a little bit crazy sounding, but this is what the mushrooms look like over here. Um, and, and you could imagine that uh, on the underside of these, you can actually see a little picture right here. On the underside of the mushroom cap, they make these things called spores. And each uh, spore is the product of a meiosis. And so we actually sort of dissected out these uh, spores and we could look at genes involved in, in, the, in a regulation of, of meiosis. So that was really cool. And I'll tell you, when I was in college, I went there thinking, oh, I'm going to be a, a, a medical doctor. I'm going to go to medical school. And um, sort of as I got into doing this research, I realized, you know, I, I'm probably fairly decent at doing this stuff. Uh, and I enjoyed it a lot. And um, maybe that's what I wanted to do. So anyway, I got out of college and I hadn't applied to medical school and uh, hadn't applied to graduate school. So what was I qualified to do? Uh, I became a technician. So I, I worked as a research technician um, at UNC Chapel Hill in this person's lab. Her name is Cora Jean Edgel. And I was a tech for three years from 96 to 99. Uh, this was a tiny lab. There were four people. Um, so it was neat because I, I really contributed to what was going on. I washed the dishes, but also did a lot of molecular biology and cell biology. And we were interested in this gene called testican. And uh, so, you know, learned a lot. And, and, and basically through these couple of years, uh, I was involved in, in two different publications. So this was like the first time I ever had publications. Um, I, I threw this, this picture on here, A, because it has a, a picture of Cora Jean, but B, there's this, this guy. Does anybody know who that is? Uh, this is like my one sort of brush with greatness. This is a guy called Oliver Smithies who won the, uh, the Nobel Prize in, I think it was like, 2007, something like that. Anyway, he, he won the Nobel Prize for uh, helping to make genetically modified animals. Uh, and his lab was on the floor above us. Uh, and, and all I knew from this guy was that he would come down periodically and have lunch with my boss. So that was my, my brush with greatness. Um, all right, so at the end of 1999, I'd been a tech for three years and I decided, well, I'm not gonna be a career tech, so what am I gonna do? I applied to graduate school and Oh, the other thing I want to show you, life happens, okay? Um, as you know, you're kind of going through all these things, various things happen. So uh, when I was a technician, I got married. So my, my family starts to increase a little bit. Uh, and then I go to graduate school. So I went from UNC Chapel Hill, uh, seven or eight miles down the road to Duke University. And at first I joined the lab of this guy. His name is Bob Abraham. And there we worked on um, uh, uh, immune cells and we worked specifically on T cells and how signaling occurs between a T cell and an antigen presenting cell. And we were really involved in cellular signaling. So trying to understand how all these different components down here talk to each other. Um, and in and, and this time we published uh, one paper um, and, and then something happened. So. Um, I'd been in the lab for almost two years and, and Bob decided he was going to leave Duke. And so to some people, this is like, like a, a speed bump. Okay. 
you know, you, you run into a little problem and you sort of jump over it and, and keep on going. To me, so I, again, graduate school is usually five, six years. This was at the end of my second year when I kind of learned all these new techniques. And to me, it felt more like this giant uh, 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 sinkhole where my life was like shattering down uh, because uh, I had to make some big changes. Well, um, I decided I had the option to go to San Diego or to stay um, at Duke. And I decided to stay at Duke and then join a, a new lab. So I joined this person's lab. Her name is Tanish Derea. And, and I'll tell you, this is probably, it's one of these things I didn't intend to happen, but really set me up for everything else I've done. So in Tanish's lab, we worked on hematopoietic stem cells. So these are the cells that give rise to all the different lineages of your blood. And, um, and, and we were actually very successful. And we published um, a, a, a variety of papers and they were in pretty high impact journals. Um, and so really kind of set the stage for, um, for, for what was to come. I told you before that as you're kind of going about doing your science, life happens. And um, it, my life happened in that I had two kids. Um, and, and these uh, dates probably look pretty similar to where you guys are, are born now, uh, kind of in the 2002, 2004 range. Uh, this guy, Ellie, is actually going to be a freshman at, at Pitt this year. Um, so, you know, science is happening, life is happening, and you keep plugging along. Well, at the end of graduate school, I decided to go and do what's called a postdoctoral fellowship. Um, and I looked at a bunch of different opportunities and for a variety of reasons, decided to go look at liver stem cells. Um, and I moved from North Carolina uh, all the way to the Pacific Northwest in Portland, Oregon. And I joined this guy's lab. His name is Marcus Crumpy. And, and he was a real expert, is a real expert um, in gene therapy and uh, liver and, and a bunch of different things. Um, and here, uh, and I'm going to tell you more in the second part of the talk about what this, this research is about. Um, but we looked at, at the role of liver and, and liver regeneration and some unique populations, uh, cellular populations within the liver. And here we had a pretty successful experience from 2005 to 2012, where um, uh, published a, a bunch of papers and some of these were in pretty high impact journals. Um, and by the time the, po the, oh, that's actually an error. That's, that's not graduate school, that's postdoc. Um, by the time this was over, I was you know, pretty well set up to go look for a faculty job. Um, and so I actually uh, sent out 23 applications in 2011, uh, interviewed at four places and three people tried to, to, to hire me. And, and I decided to come here to the University of Pittsburgh. And so my lab right now um, is in, I'm in the Department of Pathology, um, and then the lab is in a Regenerative Medicine Institute. And, and I also, like David said at the beginning, um, uh, help, help uh, run one of the sites for the Hillman Academy, which is a lot of fun. Um, so moved from uh, Portland, Oregon, all the way back east to, uh, to Pittsburgh. Um, and since 2012, um, I, I've been here running a lab um, and that's where we are. And I'll just say that, um, you know, we, we have a bunch of funding sources and people that help us out. I'll tell you, my kids are not as messy as I had shown you before. Uh, and in fact, they're now taller than I am. Um, and then, so we've got family stuff and then here's lab stuff, which is, these are the people who, who are sort of my, my lab family. Um, but I guess if, if I were to say starting out in, in high school, when I, uh, was working on, um, uh, platelets, I, I would have never believed that, that I would be doing liver regeneration in Pittsburgh at the time. So I think, it, you know, getting to where you are uh, is kind of a, a circuitous route and you kind of have to just follow a, a variety of things and work hard and, and hope that uh, you get a little bit of luck as well. All right. So that's kind of my path. And, and hopefully it just says that, you know, everybody's got a slightly different story. So let me tell you now about liver regeneration. And this is from ancient Greece to modern times. All right. Hey, did anybody have any questions about the first part? No questions now. Okay. Ask them later if you want. So here I just want to tell you kind of three little stories. So firstly, I'm going to talk about liver function and disease. And we'll talk about uh, some, some sort of weird cellular features going on in the liver called polyploidy and aneuploidy. 
and then how these can contribute to uh, liver regeneration. Um, so this is the liver. The liver is the largest solid organ in your body. And uh, I love this little cartoon because it shows that the liver uh, is kind of like this big uh, factory where uh, it stores things, it secretes things, it detoxifies things. It really uh, does a variety of different things in your body. And if you don't have it, you're not gonna live. And in fact, if your liver starts to fail uh, and it can't repair itself, you'll die. Um, and liver regeneration is, is this sort of real amazing thing. So the liver has this amazing capacity to regenerate. And this is just an image of a mouse liver. And so in the mouse and, and even in the human, you can surgically chop off a big chunk of the liver. So in the mouse, we can actually chop off about two thirds of the liver. And this is what it looks like. So you, you, basically, you just go in there and you chop it off. Um, and then within about a week, the, the liver grows back. So this is pretty amazing. You know, it gets really tiny um, and then it, and, and it basically can grow back uh, to itself. In the mouse, the liver has, um, they're called lobes. See these little, little thing, um, sort of pieces sticking out. So it's kind of like your hand, okay? You've got five different lobes. And if you chop off three of them, they actually, those three never come back. But what happens is the two that are remaining, they get bigger. And that's how liver regeneration works. So by seven to 14 days later, the liver has recovered its weight and, and the mouse is absolutely fine. Same thing happens in, in the human, but it takes a little bit longer. It's, it's in the range of like one month or so to regenerate the liver. So th this is awesome. Um, and, and, and this happens uh, all the time. Uh, uh, it happens very frequently. So we've actually known about uh, liver regeneration um, for a very long time. And, and does anybody know the story of Prometheus? Anybody want to volunteer to tell me about Prometheus? Andy, we do have one question yep. in the chat, not about Prometheus though. Okay. It says, if you lost all but one lobe, would it grow to the size of the full liver? Yeah, so people have done, that's called like a, probably like a 90% partial hepatectomy. Um, the, the, bot, the, the downside is that if you were to do that surgically, the animal would die um, most of the time because that's just not enough of the liver to maintain function. Um, but if you, you, know, you go and you do like a 90% partial hepatectomy on 10, on 10 or 20 mice, you might get one that survives or so, and it would grow back. It would grow back to the 100%. So again, the liver has this real amazing capacity to regenerate. Um, so we've known, I mean, th there is this uh, myth about uh, Prometheus. And uh, what Prometheus did is he supposedly stole uh, fire from the gods. Well, it turns out that Zeus was pretty upset with this, and he decided to punish Prometheus. So he changed Prometheus to the side of a mountain, and then for all of eternity, he says, there's uh, this liver, this, sorry, this eagle comes, sort of flies down every day, pecks out his liver, uh, you know, you can imagine that's a painful thing. You see blood coming down right here. Um, anyway, he pecks out his liver. And then at night, what happens? Uh, the liver regenerates. The liver comes back. And the very next day, Prometheus is still chained up to the mountain. Uh, he's got a full liver. Uh, the eagle comes back, pecks it out, and it goes on and on and on. So uh, to, to some extent, we've known that uh, um, uh, livers can regenerate uh, for, for a very long time. And uh, this is like the sort of tongue in cheek way that the liver field, you know, sort of tips their hat to, to ancient Greece. So that's, that's really the extent of what I'm going to tell you about ancient Greek times. What I will say is that um, liver disease um, is, is very much related to impaired regeneration. So this is a healthy human liver right here. And you can see that it's nice and smooth um, and it looks pretty good. This is a condition called cirrhosis where you get these sort of bumpy formations all over the liver. Um, and then in, in certain cases, cirrhosis can actually turn into liver cancer. And you get this sort of ugly looking liver right here that has tumors all over the place. Well, if you think about this in terms of regeneration, um, healthy liver is very competent at regenerating. And so you, you, the liver actually every day regenerates itself a little bit because if you have too much alcohol or too much of, of even normal drugs, um, uh, uh, 
medications that you might take, some of these things are toxic to your liver. So you might, you know, kill 0.1% or 1% of your liver, but then it, it you know, those 0.1 or 0.1% or can, can grow back. It's no problem. So every day we're regenerating a little bit. The problem is when you get into cirrhosis and liver cancer, the liver basically becomes unable to regenerate itself. And that's when we have problems and livers can start to fail. So what we're really interested in doing is to understand how it is that this uh, healthy liver can regenerate. And once we do that, maybe we can figure out ways to basically take these uh, regeneration impaired livers and get them to regenerate. That's sort of the overall goal that we're trying to do. All right, so that's uh, kind of the background. And now let me tell you about uh, some pretty weird cells that exist in the liver. So this is a, a section, two sections of, of uh, mouse livers um, right here. So you can imagine we chopped out a mouse liver and then uh, using a microtome, we made these uh, really flat sections, put them on a slide. And then we stained it right here with uh, the green things are just cell boundaries and the blue things are nuclei. And most of the time, I'll, I'll try one more time to get you, uh, some interaction. Um, does anybody notice anything here that looks maybe a little bit unusual? If you're some looking of the cells at, have two nuclei. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly it. Um, in, in most tissues, you would find a cell that looks like this. Just a, 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 this is one cell that has a single nucleus. But in the liver, you see cells like this guy that have two nuclei side by side. We call these uh, snowmen. They kind of look like you know, the body and the head on top of each other. So you see this binucleate hepatocyte. The hepatocytes are the main cells in the liver. Here's another binucleate hepatocyte. Here's another one, another one, and so forth. They're all over the place. And to show you this even better, we can actually um, use some enzymes and digest the liver, basically turn it from a solid organ into like just a bunch of cells that are in a dish. And this is what they look like. So here's uh, one single hepatocyte that's attached to the dish and you can see one nucleus. Um, this is a cluster of four hepatocytes right here. Um, and, and here's a single hepatocyte with two nuclei. That's those two little like eyeballs in the middle. Here's uh, another binucleate hepatocyte. Um, if you were to figure out the percentage, it's around 80%, 70 to 80% of the hepatocytes have two nuclei. So that's strange. Most cells don't do this. Um, so what is this? This is something called polyploidy. Um, and if you think about most of the cells in your body, they're diploid um, and they have 46 chromosomes. So in the liver, you get these cells that are polyploid. Uh, sometimes they can have, they're called tetraploid, which means they have 92 chromosomes in the human, or they're octoploid, which means they have 184 chromosomes and they're even higher ones. In the liver, it turns out polyploid is determined by two things, number of nuclei per cell. So usually there's one nucleus or two nuclei but then each nucleus can have different amounts of DNA packed in there. So um, as you can see in this illustration, but the bottom line is that you get cells that have multiple nuclei and sometimes they've got way more DNA packed in there. Um, they're very common. So if we just focus on a mouse right here, um, and then this is something, uh, uh, data that we got uh, using a technique called flow cytometry. Um, but it really what it tells us is um, cells that can it's sort of like a readout of the amount of DNA packed into a nucleus. And so this just says that if we look in an adult mouse, only about 10% of hepatocytes are diploid, maybe 80% are tetraploid and 15% are octoploid. Uh, it's basically uh, er, you know, everything but that 10% are polyploid. So polyploidy in the mouse liver is very common. Um, and then this on the left is more like, this is the human liver uh, this is a paper, a figure I got out of the literature that just says uh, we've got age on the bottom axis here. And it says that as you age, the number of diploids decreases and the number of polyploids increases. So what we think is that it's, it's not quite as well known in the human situation, but somewhere around 25 to 50% of hepatocytes in humans in us are polyploid. Okay, so polyploid is very common in the liver. And uh, what's it doing? What, what's this polyploidy doing? People have seen these polyploid hepatocytes, uh, not since ancient Greek times, but they've seen them since the early 1900s. So for a little more than hundred years. And despite this, 
Uh, it's only been in the last decade or so that we've started to get a handle on what these polyploid hepatocytes are doing. Um, it turns out that uh, some people have thought that they were um, terminally differentiated, which means they're just workhorses in the liver um, and that they can't proliferate. We know that's not true and I'll show you something about that in a minute. We know that these polyploid hepatocytes can divide pretty well and contribute to liver regeneration. There's another idea that when you are polyploid, you've got all this extra DNA. So maybe you just make more stuff. Maybe you make more proteins and that allows the, the liver to work at like an enhanced function. And that's actually a pretty good idea and, and people are working on this right now. And then there's some other ideas about how um, the extra chromosomes can actually protect from different injuries, um, which is a completely different story for another day. Um, so there are some good ideas about what polyploidy may be doing to help the liver, uh, but it turns out um, uh, alterations in ploidy are associated with uh, a number of different disease states, which um, is, is interesting, but you don't really know whether polyploidy causes disease or, um, or, or helps to prevent the disease. So there's a lot of correlation going on in the field. Um, and, and I'll tell you, um, I told you that I went to uh, Portland, Oregon to do my postdoctoral fellowship. And this is one of the, the very first things that I did when I was a, a postdoc. I wanted to ask this question to say, are these polyploid hepatocytes, are, can they really um, contribute to liver regeneration or not? And so I could, uh, using this technique called flow cytometry, I could uh, uh, actually isolate polyploid hepatocytes and I specifically focused on octoploids. And then I transplanted them into this mouse. Um, this is a, a knockout mouse, but what you should know is that the liver gets sick. Um, and then the, the cells that you put in, they have an advantage and can proliferate. So we wanted to know, could we take these donor polyploid cells and repopulate the liver with those donor polyploids? And three pretty amazing things happened. Number one, uh, those polyploid hepatocytes were highly regenerative. They could regenerate the liver just fine. So we could put in like 30,000 of these polyploids and they would make 30 million. So they could regenerate very, very well. The second thing that happened is that although we put in uh, octoploid hepatocytes, these ADENs, they, they made more ADENs um, and they became more polyploid, which we expected. But the really weird thing is that the ploidy went backwards. Uh, they became tetraploid and they became diploid again. There's really only one other place in your entire body um, where ploidy can go backwards. And, and, and that's meiosis. That's when you actually can make gametes. Um, but this is like the first time anyone had ever described uh, an adult cell or somatic cell that um, could give rise to, to a, a reversal of ploidy. The other thing that happened, and this is relevant for what I'm going to tell you uh, in the second or third part of this talk, is um, that as these hepatocytes were um, regenerating, they basically gained chromosomes and lost chromosomes. So they made diploids that had, I said, plus chromosome or, or minus a chromosome. Um, and, and I'll show you what that means in a sec. Um, so I told you there's polyploidy, right? Which is an increase in the number of sets of chromosomes. So from 46 to 92 or 184. Well, aneuploidy is actually it's like gain or loss of one chromosome or two chromosomes. So when I'm telling you we get uh, aneuploid cells, you, rather than having 46, maybe you get a cell with 45 chromosomes, so it lost one. Or maybe you have a tetraploid uh, that's, uh, rather than being uh, 92 uh, chromosomes, it's gained a couple, so maybe it's got 95 chromosomes. Um, and so this can actually affect the cell in a variety of different ways. Um, so we actually characterized um, mice, healthy mice, and we said, is aneuploidy not in that transplantation model, but just a normal healthy mice? Is there aneuploidy? And it turns out there is. We found um, uh, aneuploidy that was all over the place. And what we know through this sort of complicated looking graph is that the aneuploidy is completely random. Uh, chromosome, each chromosome can be gained or lost at a low frequency, but they're all equally affected, and it affects humans too. So the, the bottom line is that uh, there's some degree of aneuploidy. Uh, we think it's, it, we used to think it was pretty high, like in the range of 50 or 60%. Uh, there's some newer studies to say that it's more like 5%. That's fine. So just, just know that there is aneuploidy and your liver looks kind of like this. Um, we have diploid hepatocytes, 
I told you that humans have 46 chromosomes. You probably know that already. It turns out mice actually have 40 chromosomes in the diploid state. So they're diploid hepatocytes, there's tetraploids and octoploids. And sometimes they have the normal complement of chromosomes like you can see in red, but other times they have uh, chromosome gains and losses. And that's what all those colorful ones are that I'm showing you. So your liver is pretty heterogeneous and all that heterogeneity is just sitting there. So what's it doing? And this is where I wanna tell you a little bit about um, uh, how these sort of weird cells that we identified in the liver, how they're affecting um, liver regeneration. Anybody have any questions about that part? Andy, there is one question. I think it was um, actually still back from the cancer, but I, I missed it. Julian asked, how does cancer affect the liver and why can't it regenerate? Yeah, so the, the, that's, a, that's a great question. And it turns out that you can get these hepatocytes, uh, liver tumors, there are a bunch of different types of, of tumors that can happen in the liver depending on which cell is affected. And when those, those, um, those cells are affected, they can, they can basically grow like crazy. And um, one of the things that happens is that they essentially outcompete all the rest of the, the healthy cells that are in the liver. Um, and, and, and that's one of the main reasons. And so basically you get like loss of normal function accompanied with this really bad tumor, tumors that start to grow. Um, so it's sort of like this complex array of things that are going on. It's just a competition. Does that make sense? A little bit. Okay, so let me tell you about um, uh, aneuploidy and, and polyploidy and how they affect liver regeneration. Um, this is like a, a scheme that, that a lot of my current lab right now, uh, the work that we do is based on this. So we know very early in life, uh, this is a liver, all the livers are completely normal and they're diploid. So you see that one nucleus there. And as we start to age, uh, the livers become polyploid. So you start to see those binuclear hepatocytes with the two nuclei. Um, and then at some point, you start to get those chromosome segregation errors leading to the aneuploid hepatocytes. So this is what I think an adult liver looks like. It's what my liver looks like. Uh, it's what your livers start to look like. It's what the mouse liver looks like. This is like our normal resting state. And so my lab actually works on signals that regulate this process to become binucleate. It looks at signals that regulate aneuploidy and so forth. Um, but what I want to talk about now is what's it doing? Like, what is all this aneuploidy and polyploidy doing in the normal liver? Um, the cancer field uh, ha has this long history of saying aneuploidy and polyploidy are bad. Um, they basically set the cell up for all sorts of dysregulation, and this can lead to tumors. So this hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, which, which, you know, can be a terminal thing. Um, we actually and surprisingly, don't have a lot of data to say that like pre-existing polyploid and aneuploid in the liver do a bad thing. Um, although that's something that we're actually working on right now, it's kind of a hard question to ask. But what we do have a nice story for and some really good data are to say that the polyploid and aneuploidy, rather than doing a bad thing, actually do something good. Um, and so what we know is that they can actually help to promote liver regeneration and, and liver adaptation. And I'll show you, show you how this works. So um, this was actually based on uh, some, some work. I have, I have this friend who works on yeast and, and they showed that you can take yeast and do all sorts of terrible things to them. You can put them on fungicides or knock out vital pr uh, proteins in the yeast. And some of them actually overcome the injury and they do so by becoming aneuploid. So at least in a yeast model, when you gain a chromosome or lose a chromosome, it can actually help the yeast adapt to their injury. And we wondered whether um, this uh, aneuploidy that's sitting in the liver could help the liver overcome different types of injuries. Okay, so this is, I'm gonna show you like just what one experiment that we did to see if this was happening in the liver. So we took this mouse right here, this is a, a, a a mouse that was lacking this gene called FAH and another gene called HGD. And I apologize because I'm gonna show you like a metabolic pathway and uh, you, you may zone out. Sometimes I zone out when I'm showing you these pathways too. 
But we asked whether um, in this model, it could help to promote a, a regeneration. Okay, so here it is. This is like what's happening in, in most all of us and in, in wild type mice, which is that uh, uh, the amino acid tyrosine gets broken down through all these enzymes, TAT, HPD, and so forth, all the way down here to fumarate and acetoacetate. So this is normal, okay? Well, it turns out there's a condition called hereditary tyrosinemia, which is a, a, an inborn error of metabolism that affects kids, um, a subset of kids. Um, and we can model this in mice by knocking out this gene called FAH. In both cases, FAH is gone. And, and this is a bad thing because what happens is this step, it's a fumarole acetoacetate is not converted into the, the bottom step. And when you get a buildup of fumarole acetoacetate, um, it's genotoxic. Basically the liver gets sick, uh, you have all kinds of problems and you can die. All right, so you don't wanna get buildup of fumarole acetoacetate. Well, you can treat the uh, patients and you can treat the FAH knockout mice like this you can give them a drug called NTBC that basically blocks the pathway up at the top. Um, and when you do this, they're actually okay. So your body doesn't really mind if you get uh, this one, this 4-hydroxyphenylpyruvate. It doesn't really mind too much of that. The good thing is that you're not getting uh, the, the, the buildup of this, uh, the bad guy, the fumarole acetoacetate. Okay, there's also another way you could potentially treat this disease and that would be knock out um, or, or remove um, another gene in the pathway. And so what we do know is that you can, if you have no FAH, which is bad, you can also remove this gene called HGD and those mice and, uh, are, are absolutely healthy as well. So I'll hey, refer Andy, back to this. We have, a, yep. Andy, we have a quick question, sorry to interrupt, uh, but it's, I, uh, I think will be good clarifying question. Uh, Amanda's asking, how do you selectively make sure that FAH does not work in experiments? In other words, what is an FAH knockout? Oh, that's, that's a great question. And we could go back to that guy I said won the Nobel Prize, Oliver Smithies, where they were helping to make, uh, figure out how to make these uh, genetically modified and knockout animals. So basically, um, uh, so a knockout animal is just one where you've modified the DNA in such a way that uh, it's incapable of expressing that particular gene and making that particular protein. So you basically, you have an animal that's completely lacking um, FAH uh, uh, or, or whatever gene you want in all of their tissues um, in all of their cells. Turns out there's some very sophisticated ways where you can knock out genes in the liver only or in the heart or in the brain. Uh, but in this case, the FAH knockout is in every single cell in the body. Um, I told you that uh, um, normally if you, get, if you have FAH loss, that the cells, that the mice would die. So what we do is we have these FAH knockout mice, um, and for their entire life, we uh, treat them with this, uh, this drug, NTBC. We actually put it in their drinking water. And so that's what keeps them happy and healthy and alive. Um, I hope that answered your question. So here's the experiment we did. All right, so we took mice that uh, didn't have FAH, okay, so they don't have FAH, and they actually, rather than having uh, two copies of HGD, they only had one. Um, so this situation, basically, uh, the mice, if we remove NTBC, they should get sick and die. And that's what mostly happens. So here is our mouse, we remove NTBC, and most of those mice uh, get sick and die of liver failure. But what was really striking is that there were survivors and, and their livers became completely repopulated. Um, you can actually, one of the things we do in the lab is you can monitor body weight. And if you, if you start to get sick, you don't eat so well. And so if you're a sick mouse, your body weight drops. But if you're you know, happy and healthy, you're eating fine and your body weight stays the same. So one of the things we do when we're during these experiments is just a couple of times a week, we, we weigh the mice. And what you can see is in the black lines here, these are the experimental mice we're talking about, um, FAH knockout, HDD heterozygous. And you'll see that if we put the weight at 100%, the, 
the way uh, over about a month tanks goes down, 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 down. And what I'm not showing you here are the mice that died and, and many of them died. And so those just went boom, 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 all the way down and died. Um, but in the subset, uh, the mice for some reason started to feel better, started eating and the, and the weight goes up. Well, if you look at their livers um, after just three to four weeks um, after the injury, this is what it looks like. So I, I should have put a picture here to show you a nice healthy liver. Healthy livers are nice and red and smooth, uh, kind of like that human liver I'd shown in a, in a previous slide. Well, this one is mostly pale. Pale is just a sick, uh, dying liver. But these were decorated with these red, sort of normal looking um, uh, 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 clusters of cells. So each one of these, this is not a cell that I'm pointing at right here. This is probably thousands of cells that have started to grow. So we thought, this is pretty strange. What's going on? Why are these livers starting to recover and actually have some regeneration going on? And what we um, hypothesized is that, uh, remember, we had lost FAH, and they only had one copy already based on our genetic model of HGD. So we thought they might have lost that second copy of HGD. Uh, and that would have basically allowed them to, to be happy and healthy and go on to, to regenerate. So this is sort of the, what, what we think uh, may, may have happened. Um, it turns out HGD sits on chromosome 16. So in our model, uh, we've already knocked out or we've lost one copy of chromosome 16. So we think those nodules were probably coming from an aneuploid cell that had lost chromosome 16. So basically something like this. The liver um, is, you know, I told you aneuploidy is sitting there anyway in the adult liver and it's completely random. So maybe these little blue cells had lost chromosome 16. And then when we induce the injury, we remove that NTBC, they have an advantage and start to proliferate and go on and regenerate the liver. And that's what we think those little red healthy nodules were that I showed you in the previous slide. How can we test this? So basically we took these uh, uh, livers that were starting to get regenerated and we said, what do their chromosomes look like? And using a couple of different techniques, we could show that those, those uh, regenerating nodules had, um, had basically lost chromosome 16. So loss of chromosome 16, allowed, which also lost that final copy of HCD, allowed those hepatocytes to regenerate uh, just fine. Uh, we could show it, this is kind of a weird way to look at it. This looks even better. So what I'm showing you here um, are, are four different mice and you can see on the bottom, there's like chromosome one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And if the, the little black line is in the middle, it means there's no change in, in, G, in chromosome copy number. But when we get all the way down here to chromosome 16, it goes basically to the bottom. That means a loss. And so in each of these four mice that we looked at um, that had been repopulated, um, uh, they had lost that, that other copy of chromosome 16. So we know from this that loss of chromosome 16 promotes that adaptive response and, and facilitates liver regeneration. So really- Andy, Andy we have, uh, sorry, another question. Is, uh -huh. uh, Sam is asking, did they lose the entire chromosome 16? And his follow-up question is, is chromosome 16 not important to the liver otherwise? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's really a key question. What we find is that, um, we think they lost about two thirds of chromosome 16. Um, so this is actually pretty much to scale. We know that HGD is right here in the middle of chromosome 16. So it looks like there was a break somewhere around this point, um, kind of toward the left side of, of the chromosome um, where they had lost really like the, the, the basically the business end and, and the one that includes uh, HGD. Um, is, so it's sort of a mystery as to why the cells are able, um, uh, why the cells are able to, to get along without that, that, last, that, that other copy of um, chromosome 16. What I will say is that they still had one functional copy. They still had this one that uh, really, the only thing different about the one that they maintained was they had a, a, um, a knockout of HGD. So they still had all, one, at least one copy of all the genes uh, except HGD, so they were um, able to maintain that function. So it's not a complete loss of both copies, it was just a complete loss of 
one full copy of, of chromosome 16, but loss of both copies of HGD. It, it gets to be like, uh, this is a, a nice convenient model for uh, demonstrating our point, but how is this really relevant to, to, to the human situation? And I'll show you that in just a moment. Um, so this is sort of like the concept that we're pushing, which is that um, in our adult livers, we've got uh, in your liver and the mouse liver, uh, we've got this aneuploidy that's just sitting there. It's completely random. And we think that there's chronic injury. So chronic injury could be um, uh, tyrosinemia. We remove that NTBC drug, or it could be a variety of other chronic diseases like uh, too much alcohol or uh, hepatitis infection. There's all sorts of chronic things that basically affect the liver for a long, long time. And we know that you might have this blue cell right here. This is the one that had lost chromosome 16. And when you have an injury situation, most of the cells get sick, but those that have a special advantage might be able to proliferate and go on and maintain function. And that's exactly what we saw in the model I just showed you. Um, and, and Andy, we have another question. Go for it. Uh, they're ask, Julian asked, did the loss of chromosome 16 affect the mouse in any other way outside of the liver? Yeah, that, that was, um, so it's really, uh, I think that, um, it, so in the, to the extent that we looked, the only place you got that selection or the, those cells, like these blue cells that lost 16, the only place that they had an ability to, they kicked out the chromosome 16 and then grew without it was in the liver. So everything else was pretty much unaffected um, and, and they were absolutely fine. Um, that's what's, it's interesting because, you know, the, the liver basically sits in its own little universe right there. And the, so the way these chromosomes uh, affect each other in the adult uh, don't really apply to, to other organs like that. So just to, to sort of conclude this part, and this is really the last part, um, I'll say that similar to what my friend had shown in yeast, where aneuploidy can promote uh, regeneration and adaptation, we find that the same thing is true in the liver. Um, and then in this particular model with the HGD heterozygotes, FAH knockouts, um, they basically regenerate with these naturally occurring aneuploid hepatocytes. So basically those that um, you know, had, had lost that chromosome 16. And we think there's probably um, different forms of aneuploidy that could uh, facilitate adaptation to other forms of, uh, of chronic injury. And, and like, what are those? And the place that we're starting to look right now is here. Um, so this is a, a paper I got out of the literature, but it shows a liver. And this liver has a lot of cirrhosis. And remember I showed you a cirrhotic liver early on that had like all the that bumpiness and it looked kind of gross. Well, this is just a, a sort of a microscopic image, but what you can find are these areas right here, like with M, and then you see other ones that are like just these little clusters, we call these nodules. Um, and what these people showed was that um, some of those little clusters were basically derived from a, one single cell. So the ones called M, they I mean monoclonal. So that means you've got this disease situation. This is a, a disease called um, hepatitis C infection. And there was one single hepatocyte that basically in the context of disease started to grow um, and, 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 um, and, and for whatever reason, um, it, it you know, made this little cluster right here. And we actually think that um, you could pull out these individual clusters or clones and or, or nodules and, and see if different forms of aneuploidy gave rise to those different, um, those different nodules. And that's what we're starting to do. We're getting these human specimens. We can use a, a technique called laser capture micro dissection to come in here and like chop that out of the liver. Um, and then we can do some genomic techniques to look at aneuploidy and gene expression. And what I really need people like you for because I don't know how to do any sort of analysis of like genomic stuff, right? Like I don't know how to, how to like look at these uh, huge data sets and tell me what uh, the aneuploidy is doing, chromosome gains and losses and how that's affecting gene expression. And um, uh, that's just totally out of my wheelhouse. And, and I think one thing that's exciting is uh, having a lab where, you know, you can have these sort of what I think are cool projects 
but then work with really smart people like you guys who are way more qualified to, to help um, and push forward and develop sort of um, algorithms and, and workflows to help us understand what's going on with some of these complex things. Um, and just to sort of wrap it all up, we're really trying to figure out, um, you know, in a liver like this, where you get cirrhosis that's accompanied with a failure to regenerate, um, what can, can we use some of these cellular things that we're learning maybe about aneuploidy and polyploidy to figure out how to rescue these livers, how to give them more of a regenerative response uh, so that they can, can repair themselves. And with that, I'm, I'm gonna stop and just say that um, there are a lot of people who have helped with this work. Um, and then probably like you know we're doing right now, this is sort of what the lab looks like. Uh, everything we do has become Zoom based and so forth. Um, but, but yeah, I can, uh, I can take any questions. I think that's, that's it. So we do, we have a question from Alexander. She asked a while ago, so I'll ask her to clarify if I, if we need to. She said, wouldn't the cell be more at risk after it's adapted since it's more homogenous? Wouldn't it be more at risk? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So what you're saying is if you've got this like heterogeneous liver right here, and I think that's what you're saying, and then you go and you adapt it this way, um, you know, maybe it's mostly all lacking that chromosome 16. So what happens if you get a very different insult? Is that cell, is that your question? Is it like more at risk to, yeah. uh, for, for other problems? Yeah. Okay, that, that's, we, we're actually trying to test that, that question right now. Um, but what I can tell you is it's not 100% of the cells right here that become you know, loss of chromosome 16. There's still these other ones that are either normal or you know, maybe gain chromosome three like the red one or lost chromosome 19 like the purple one. So I actually think, and we're trying to test this, that it's very plastic that you could um, you know, it, do chronic injury here with tyrosinemia like we did, adapted to chromosome 16 loss. And then we have this other model where we can knock out this gene called DICER which is involved in making something called microRNAs. And we think that leads to another regenerative response. So I think you could actually like, sort of adapt in, in like multiple different ways. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to test that. Does it make them less fit right here for adaptation? I don't think so, but, but we'll see. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. What else? Any other questions, guys? Does anybody have any ideas? Like how can we, what would you test? What would you, if you could cut out these, uh, shoot, I can't get back to it. If you could cut out those um, nodules and you wanna uh, do like a genomic test to look at aneuploidy, uh, you know, is that one losing chromosome 16 or gaining chromosome five? And then what I think would be really cool is to sort of simultaneously look at, um, do like an RNA seq and look and see what uh, genes are changing, you know, in the context of that chromosome gain or loss. Um, nobody's ever looked at uh, epigenetics um, associated with these things. So I think there are a lot of different um, uh, sort of uh, real molecular and, and sort of um, uh, high throughput ways that we could go about looking at these individual nodules if we have enough money to do that. Um, I have a question about livers. It's, it's sort of unrelated, but what is dialysis? Yeah, so dialysis is typically, people talk about that in terms of kidneys. So that's, that's when your, so your blood gets filtered through your kidney and it, and it removes sort of the toxic parts of, of the blood. Um, and so when your kidneys start to fail, uh, you can go on dialysis and they basically treat your blood like that. Um, people, I, I'm not aware that people talk about that in terms of liver though. Yeah, sorry about that. Like I was just watching a medical show where people had like drug overdoses or they, they, were, they consumed too much alcohol. So I thought they were related, but never mind. You know, there are, um, 
one of the big things that people talk about in terms of, of liver regeneration, and we actually do this too, is um, we, we were talking about uh, long-term liver regeneration, like in terms of like this chronic injury by tyrosinemia, which lasts over months. But the other way you can think about liver regeneration is like in that surgical model where you go and you chop off two thirds of the liver. You can do that chemically. And one way you can, you can really damage and rock the liver is, is do an overdose of Tylenol. So everybody here probably takes Tylenol sometimes. And have you heard that Tylenol, if you take too much, it's a bad thing? You guys heard that? It is. Um, if you overdose on Tylenol, you can cause liver failure um, and you can die. And it's actually a big problem where people um, might be taking like a cold medicine, you know, to help with runny nose and sneezing. And it also has um, Tylenol in it. And you don't realize Tylenol is in that medicine. And then you take Tylenol by itself and you're feeling bad. So you double the dose or something. You know what I mean? Like you can see how people might accidentally take too much Tylenol or intentionally they do it too. So we do this in mice where we give them a certain dose of Tylenol and it basically and very rapidly uh, will just kill part of their liver. And then uh, you can watch the part that doesn't get killed will start to grow back very rapidly. Um, I don't know about the term dialysis though in terms of, of, of uh, in that sort of a situation. Um, can I ask like what specifically about Tylenol? makes it so dangerous? I mean, like as opposed to other medicine? Yeah, so this, ha I would have to show you another big uh, pathway. But so what happens is you, um, when you take Tylenol, it's metabolized by the liver, it gets broken down into different parts. And um, there's a number of enzymes in the liver that are involved in this. And so Tylenol gets broken down into two components. And I forget this component, but this one is called NAPQI. Well, it turns out the one NAPQI is really bad and, and, and it can act as like, I think a, a free radical. It can go around and, and basically cause DNA damage um, and, and make these things called DNA adducts that, that are really bad for, for the cells and it basically causes them to die. So it really just has to do with the, the metabolism of breaking down acetaminophen into its into, into the different parts. And one of those parts is actually very toxic. I can send you some papers on it though. Any other questions? Make it. You can hear, probably hear my kids in the background. That's okay. okay. They had a question. <laughs> um, so regarding like the question from much earlier about um, just one lobe of the liver. So it's like if you had like four lobes and then two lobes were cut off, and then you allowed the remaining two to grow to full size, and then you removed one of the two. Oh, so, after that, after yeah, that, would it would would like it just become a large singular lobe or? Yeah, that I, I think that would happen, and and I think people have done something like that. Um, it's it becomes so. I, I'll tell you, I, I have a, a PhD. I can do all kinds of mouse surgeries, but I'm, I'm a hack, okay? Like I can make it work in the mouth, but I'm not particularly elegant. I'm not a, a, a real surgeon. <laughs> um, and so maybe if you had, um, you know, real surgeons, it, it becomes kind of a technical challenge where you've got the five lobes and you chop off these three and those two grow back. It becomes, and then you, if you were to open up the mouse again, it, it, I think people have done this who are more expert at doing surgeries where you can chop off one lobe uh, and then the other one does grow back, but it's actually technically a, a challenging thing, more challenging than you might um, it, expect. But one, one thing we can do is I told you we've got that um, mouse that gets the liver failure, the FAH knockout mouse. So we can take 30,000 hepatocytes, transplant them into this mouse, and those 30,000 will make 30 million, okay? Um, and that's like, you know, that's a huge expansion. And then we can isolate hepatocytes from this mouse and transplant them into a second mouse and it'll repopulate and transplant into a third mouse and they repopulate. People have done this like eight times, which is just massive, massive expansion of like the original donor hepatocytes. And, and I think after doing eight rounds of transplantation, which took 
several years to do. Uh, the, the people, this is in my old lab, uh, basically lost the, the, the enthusiasm to continue doing that. Basically, these mouse hepatocytes would never stop regenerating when you do them in this sort of a situation. So hepatocytes have this incredible ability to regenerate and proliferate. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? So Andy, you probably don't know anything about this. Uh, as a kid, I was diagnosed with Rydell's lobe, the, uh -huh. an extra lobe in the liver. Do you know anything about it? Do I have any uh -huh. you know, special superpowers with this extra lobe? Um, that, that could be why you're extraordinary. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I've ne I've, honestly, I've never heard of that. Yeah, I think it's pretty rare. And I, I, it's funny, as you were giving a talk, I realized I never, I've literally never looked it up either. Yeah. <laughs> this is like one of these things as a kid, I remember being diagnosed with the only reason I remember the name because it sounds like right elbow. So I right, can always right. remember it, but I knew, I know absolutely nothing about it. Huh. You prepared to have more of your liver removed. Right. <laughs> well, we, we can, we can do a biopsy and take a look at it. How's that? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, Thanks, Andy, for coming, talking to everyone. Uh, thank you guys for, for being here on a Friday. We've had lots of talks this week. Uh, and Solomon, you have a social activity planned for people at four, is that right? Yes. Perfect, so um, hopefully everyone can come back at four and can get to know each other and just have some fun. Mm -hmm. um, but if not, we'll see you guys on Monday. Andy, again, thank you so much. I hope that you get to meet some of these students uh, next year. Yeah, I'll look forward to seeing you guys and, and I hope uh, everybody stays safe and, and has a good rest of the summer and, and you uh, learn a lot and make some good progress. And thanks for the good questions. I'll All see right. you guys. Take care. Hey, everyone. Feel free, if you, want, if you have any other questions, you can shoot me an email. And Andy, if you send us the slides, we can post them on our Google Classroom. Um, and I think your email address